Now we are still in the process of connecting the garage portion of our house to the main portion of the house. And there will be the same wooden floor joists, BCIs, across this open area eventually, just like the rest of the house, except all the way across the garage, they will be 16 inches deep instead of 12. So we are attaching this 4x8 to the wall to create a place for those joists to rest, a place for them to bear. In some situations, you can just buy hangers that would hold each floor joist up. They're expensive. The ordering process is very specific, but that didn't work here because this is a very non-typical angle. So we're using a ledger. This ledger is supported in at least three ways. It's held up on the ends. It's also glued, back nailed through the sheeting, and screwed to the studs behind it. These GRK screws are very large and very aggressive. So to be safe, we drilled pilot holes first. Usually a pilot hole in wood is about the same size, perhaps a little smaller than the root diameter of the screw. The root diameter is the diameter at the inside of the threads. A pilot hole keeps the wood from splitting when you drive that wedge that is a big screw like this into a stud. And it is never a bad idea. I'm standing over our new staircase, or where the new staircase will terminate, putting together the final pieces of the opening that will receive those stairs. You probably recognize these rim boards, but the material I'm working with now is a little different. It's called an LVL or a Versalam. It's very similar to the rim boards in the way it looks and feels, but it's a quarter of an inch thicker, it's inch and three quarter, and it is stronger. I'm using it to span the opening above the stairs. Rim boards provide compressive strength from the crushing weight of the walls. But LVLs, or Versalams, are beams that provide tensile strength across openings. Your plans should specify which type of material is required in the specific places. You probably noticed my friend Matt Royston here looking over a set of plans in a previous video. Matt has been helping me design and plan the corbels that will eventually be installed in the roof system and will be holding up the overhangs at the gable ends. Matt has a lot of experience with craftsman style houses and he has a good design sense. He's back today with a couple of prototypes that he's made for us to have a look at. This house has almost 30 corbels altogether, and they're going to be a very noticeable part of the appearance and the exterior trim features of the house. Unlike in most cases today, these corbels are structural. In other words, they've got to be strong because they are working. But the strength part is relatively easy. What we are trying to think of today is ways to make them beautiful also, and that is not so easy. Like most design items on the exterior of a house, this is primarily a matter of individual taste and opinion. And we spent a good amount of time talking and balancing what we thought would make a nice look. The finished corbels are sort of a combination of these prototypes, and you'll see them here before too long once we start into the roof system itself. What Daniel and I are doing here is called ranging a line. I need to know where the rim board on this wall between the bathroom and the garage will intersect the rim board on the main house in a nice straight line. Now I could figure this out by measuring and calculating, probably, eventually, but ranging it is both quicker and more accurate. Daniel is holding the string exactly above the outside edge of the top of the wall and I'm moving the string until the midpoint of the line is exactly above the same edge of the same wall. 
When we both agree that it is where it belongs, we have extended the line of that wall until it intersects the edge of the main body of the house. I make a mark. I can count on this being the correct location where the rim board should land so that the walls that go on top of this later will be straight and I did not have to measure anything to get it. This introduces a whole line of thinking about carpentry that in my opinion is super important. I call it the doctrine of anti-tape and it's this, that you should avoid measuring as often as possible. I didn't say that you should not cut things the right length. I said that you should avoid getting out your tape measure whenever you can. The fastest method is usually the most direct method. So sometimes you snap a line and cut in place, or range a string, or scribe, or template, or jig, and not only are these methods faster, but very often, in fact in almost every case, they're more accurate and predictable with a lower possible margin of error. As I work through this little floor joist section, I'm almost entirely scribing the pieces in order to get the marks. You'll see this done a lot through the rest of the framing of this house, but we may not always draw attention to it. The important thing is that you are aware that it is perfectly acceptable to scribe a piece in place instead of measuring it with a tape. This little section of this house is by far the most complex portion of the whole house. You've got this, these two angles. You know, you have this big rectangle and this little, what is this, a trapezoid, coming together at an angle, a poorly defined angle, over a stairway with one, two, three gables and three ridges all tying in in the same area, over a set of winders. It's terrific. And I can tell you that there's been a lot of head scratching done by me. In residential construction, there is a wide range of detail that, is, that can be or that is included in the plans. And the plans that Gary Fadness drew and then that we revised and worked up are, you know, it, it may be the best set of plans I've ever worked on on a residential project. 
I just really like the way he lays out his drawings. But even though this is a good set of plans, this is a tricky spot in the house. This is a great set of plans. It's got a lot of detail, but not every detail, especially in a spot like this where everything comes together and creates a situation where the framer has to earn his money because there's a certain amount of this that just has to be figured out in the moment, in the situation. The way I like to approach a, a puzzle like this, in fact, maybe this is the only way to approach a puzzle like this, is to start with what the plans do give you. Now we're committed to that because of the foundation. We're committed to that because of the location of the walls. And we were very specific in locating things like this column and the little plumbing walls and those kinds of things are specified on the plans and so are scrupulously located because at that point in the process, that's all you know. But as you come up higher and the information that you know is brought up to the level where you have to begin to figure out the things you don't know, at least you have certainty on that part of your calculation. So starting from what you have and working towards what you don't know is an incremental thing that cannot be rushed. One of the um, unintended consequences of using engineered wood products in a floor system like this is that engineered wood products can only be used in specific ways and specific applications. If these joists were all 2x12s, sawn 2x12s, I would have more flexibility in connections and in hangers and in nailing and in spacing and, and in um, compressive loads. So you give up some flexibility when you step from a sawn joist system to an engineered wood product system. We've got this choppy little portion just about figured out on the deck. The top flight of stairs is ready to go in. We'll get the stairs in and the decking on and we'll be ready to push out over the garage, throw some joists out there and run the decking out on that other area. So we have the whole expanse of the second floor of this house available for what's going to happen next.